Hello everyone, Megha here. So it's lockdown time and sitting home, we students are preparing for medical entrances, that is NEET 2020. And bio, which is on the top of the subject list to study always. But sometimes we get bored studying the same lines on our own. But it is important too. While I was reading, I thought if someone could go on speaking line by line the NCRT and I would just listen and study. But it isn't available. So, with this idea, I made this channel so that chapter-wise, I will read the biology NCRT line by line from my book. Um, like an audiobook, you know. So, without wasting time, let's get started with the first chapter of 11 standard NCRT, The Living World. How wonderful is this living world? The wide range of living types is amazing. The extraordinary habitats in which we find living organisms, be it cold mountains, deciduous forests, ocean, freshwater lakes, deserts, or hot springs, leave us speechless. The beauty of the galloping horse, of the migrating birds, the valley of flowers, or the attacking shark evokes a, an, a deep sense of wonder. The ecological conflict and cooperation among the member of population and among the population of a community or even the molecular traffic inside a cell make us deeply reflect on what ended is life. This question has two implicit questions within it. The first is the technical one and seeks answer to what living is as opposed to the non-living and the second is a philosophical one and seeks answer to what the purpose of life is. As scientists, we shall not attempt answering the second question. We will try to reflect on what is living. What is living? When we try to define living, we conventionally look for distinctive characteristics exhibited by living organisms, growth, reproduction, ability to sense environment, and mount a suitable response to come over our mind immediately as unique features of living organisms. One can add a few more features like metabolism, ability to self-replicate, self-organize, interact and emergence to this list. Let us try to understand each of this. All living organisms grow. Increase in the cell mass and increase in the number of individuals are twin characteristics of growth. A multicellular organism grows by cell division. In plants, this growth by cell divisions occurs continuously throughout the lifespan. In animals, growth is seen only up to certain age. However, the cell division occurs in cell tissues to replace the lost cells. Unicellular organisms grow by cell division. One can easily observe this in in vitro cultures by simply counting the number of cells under the microscope. In majority of higher animals and plants, growth and reproduction are mutually exclusive events. One must remember that increase in body mass is considered as growth. Non-living objects also grow if we take increase in body mass as a criterion for growth. Mountains, boulders and sand molds do grow. However, this kind of growth exhibited by non-living objects is by accumulation of material on the surface. In living organism, growth is from inside. Growth, therefore, cannot be taken as a defining property of living organism. Conditions under which it can be observed in all living organisms have to be explained and then we understand that it is the characteristic of living organism. A dead organism does not grow. Reproduction, likewise, is a characteristic of living organisms. In multicellular organisms, reproduction refers to the re production of progeny possessing features more or less similar to those of parents. Invariably and implicitly, we refers to sexual reproduction. Organisms reproduce by asexual means also. Fungi multiply and spread easily due to the millions of asexual spores they produce. In lower organisms like yeast and hydra, we observe budding. In planaria, that is flat forms, we observe true regeneration, that is, a fragmented organism regenerates the lost part of its body and becomes a new organism. The fungi, the filamentous algae, the protonym of mosses, all easily multiply by fragmentation. 
When it comes to unicellular organisms like bacteria, unicellular algae or amoeba, reproduction is synonymous with growth, that is, increase in the number of cells. We have already defined growth as equivalent to increase in the number of cell or mass. Hence, we notice that in single-celled organisms, we are not very clear about the usage of these two terms, growth and reproduction. Further, there are many organisms which did not reproduce, like mules, sterile worker bees, infertile human couples, etc. Hence, reproduction also cannot be an all-inclusive defining characteristic of living organism. Of course, no non-living no non -living object is capable of reproducing or replicating by itself. Another characteristic of life is metabolism. All living organisms are made up of chemicals. These chemicals, small and big, belonging to various classes, sizes, functions, etc., are constantly being made and change into some other biomolecules. These conversions are chemical reaction or metabolic reactions. There are thousands of metabolic reactions occurring simultaneously inside all living organisms, be they unicellular or multicellular. All plants, animals, and fungi, and microbes exhibit metabolism. The sum total of all the chemical reactions occurring in our body is metabolism. No non-living object exhibits metabolism. Metabolic reactions can be demonstrated outside the body in cell-free systems. And isolated metabolic reactions outside the body of an organism performed in a test tube is neither living nor non-living. Hence, while metabolism is a defining feature of all living organisms without exception, isolated metabolic reactions in vitro are not living things but surely living reactions. Hence, cellular organization of body is the defining features of life forms. Perhaps the most obvious and technically complicated feature of all living organisms is the ability to sense the surroundings or environment and respond to the, these environmental stimuli which would be physical, chemical or biological. We sense our environment through our sense of organs. Plants respond to external factors like light, water, temperature and other organisms and pollutants, etc. All organisms from the prokaryotes to the most complex eukaryote can sense and respond to the environmental uh, cues. Photoperiod effects, a photoperiod affects reproduction in seasonal breeders, both plants and animals. All organisms handle chemicals entering their bodies. All organisms, therefore, are aware of their surroundings. Human being is the only organism who is aware of himself, that is, has self-consciousness. Consciousness, therefore, becomes the defining property of the living organism. When it comes to human beings, it is all the more difficult to define the living state. We observe patients lying in coma and hospitals virtually supported by the machines which replace, uh, replace heart and lungs. The patient is otherwise brain dead. The patient has no self-consciousness. Are such patients who never come back to normal life, living or non-living? In higher classes, you will come to know that all living phenomena are due to underlying interactions. Properties of tissues are not present in the constituent cell but arise as a result of interactions among the constituent cells. Similarly, properties of the cellular organelle are not present in the, in the molecular constituent of the organelle but arise as a result of interactions among the molecular components comprising the organelle. These interactions result in emergent properties at a higher level of organization. This phenomenon is due to the hierarchy of organizational complexity at all levels. Therefore, we can say that living organisms are self-replicating, evolving and self-regulating interactive systems capable of responding to the external stimuli. Biology is a story of life on Earth. Biology is the story of evolution of living organism on Earth. All living organisms, present, past and future are linked to one another by sharing a common genetic material, but to varying degrees. Diversity in the living world 
If you look around, you will see a large variety of living organisms, be it potted plants, insects, birds, your pets or other animals and plants. There are also several organisms that you cannot see with your naked eye, but they are all around you. If you were to increase the area that you make observation in, the range and the variety of organisms that you see would increase. Obviously, if you were to visit a dense forest, you would probably see a much greater in number and kinds of living organisms in it. Each different kind of plant, animal or organisms that you see represent species. The number of species that are known and described range are between 1.7 to 1.8 million. This refers to biodiversity or the number and types of organisms present on earth. We should remember that here, that is, we explore new areas and even old ones. New organisms are continuously being identified. As stated earlier, there are millions of plants and animals in the world. We know the plants and animals in our own area by the local names. These local names would vary from place to place, even within our country. Probably, you would recognize the confusion that would be created if we did not find the ways and means to talk to each other to refer to the organisms we are talking about. Hence, there is a need to standardize the naming of living organism such that a particular organism is known by the same name all over the world. This process is called nomenclature. Obviously, nomenclature or naming is only possible when the organism is, is described correctly and we know what organism, what organism the name is attached to. This is identification. In order to facilitate the study, number of scientists have established procedures to assign a scientific name to each known organism. This is acceptable to the biologist all over the world. For plants, scientific names are based on the agreed principle and criteria which are provided by the International Code for Botanical Nomenclature, that is ICBN. You may ask, how are animals named? Animal te taxonomists have in evolved International Code of Zoological Nomenclature, that is ICZN. The scientific names ensure that each organism has only one name. Description of any organism should be enable the people in any part of the world to arrive at the same name. They also ensure that such a name has not been used for any other known organism. Biologists follow universally accepted principles to provide scientific names to known organisms. Each name has two components, the generic name and the specific epithet. This system of providing a name with two components is called binomial nomenclature. This naming system is given by Carolus Linnaeus, is being practiced by biologists all over the world. This naming system, using a two-word format, was found convenient. Let us take the example of mango to understand the way of providing scientific names better. The scientific name of mango is written as Magnifera Antica. Let us see how it is a binomial name. In this name, Magnifera represents the genus, while Indica is a particular species or a specific epithet. Other universal rules of nomenclature are as follows. First, biological names are generally in Latin and written in italics. They are Latinized or derived from Latin irrespective of their origin. The first second rule is that the first word in a biological name represent the genus, while the second component denotes the specific epithet. Third, both the words in a biological name, when handwritten, are separately underlined or printed in italics to indicate the Latin origin. Fourth, the first word denoting the genus starts with a capital letter, while the specific, its specific epithet starts with small letter. It can be illustrated with an example of Magnifera Indica. Name of the author appears after the specific epithet, that is, at the end of the biological name and is written in an abbreviated form that is magnifera indica then 
it indicates that this species was first named by Linnaeus. Since it is nearly impossible to study all the living organisms, it is necessary to devise some means to make this possible. This process is classification. Classification is the process by which anything is grouped into convenient categories based on some easily observable characters. For example, we easily recognize groups such as plants or animals or dogs, cats or insects. The moment we use any of these terms, we associate certain characters with the organisms in that group. What, ima what imagine do you see? Oh, I'm sorry. What image do you see when you see a dog? Obviously, each one of us will see dogs and not cats. Now, if we were to think of elastins, we know that we are talking about. Similarly, suppose we are to say mammals. You, sh you would, of course, think of animals with external ears and body hair. Likewise, in plants, if we try to talk about wheat, the picture in each of our mind will be of wheat plants and not rice or any other plant. Hence, all these dogs, cats, mammals, wheat, rice, plants, animals, etc. are convenient categories we use to study organisms. The scientific term for this category is taxa. Here, you must recognize that taxa can, uh, can indicate categories at very different levels. Plants also form a taxa. Wheat is also a taxa. Similarly, animals, mammals, dogs are all taxa. But you know that dog is a mammal and mammals are animals. Therefore, animals, mammals and dogs represent taxa at different levels. Hence, based on the characteristics, all living organisms can be classified into taxa. This process of classification is taxonomy. External and internal structure along with the structure of cell development processes and ecological information of organisms are essential and form the basis of modern taxonomical studies. Hence, characterization, identification, classification and nomenclature are the processes that are basic to taxonomy. Taxonomy is not something new. Human beings have always been interested in knowing more and more about the various kinds of organisms, particularly with reference to their own use. In earlier days, human beings need to find sources for the basic needs of food, clothing and shelter. Hence, the earliest classification were based on the uses of various organisms. Human beings were since long not only interested in knowing more about different kinds of organisms and their diversities, but also the relationships among them. This branch of study was referred to as systematics. The word systematics is derived from the Latin word systema, which means systematic arrangement of organisms. Linnaeus used Systema Nature as the title of his publication. The scope of systematics was later enlarged to include identification, nomenclature, and classification. Systematics takes into account evolutionary relationships between the organism. So the next topic, that is taxonomic categories, will be available to you in part 2. If you find this useful, share it with your friends and do like, subscribe, and comment. So let's together listen and learn biology. See you there.